Um, but I want to close with this question, um, because what you're doing, what you've done tonight, and, and what you are doing as a part of this bigger project is modeling an interfaith conversation, a conversation between people of various worldviews, um, who still see a sort of shared project as valuable, uh, coming together for a conversation about the Bible and the different ways that you understand it and the different ways that it impacts the way that you live your life. So I think this question is a great sort of note to close on. And that is how can Christians, or I'll expand the question to say, or anyone's experience of the Bible be enriched by reading it together with their non-Christian or non-religious neighbors? So how does coming together with people who don't don't share your worldview to talk about this, to even to read this text together. How does that um, enrich or change your experience of the book? So it's to anyone. Well, at the um, one of my jobs is the interfaith um, chapel at Westfield State University, and uh, we have an interfaith Bible study. So the Muslim students, the Jewish students, and Christian students come together uh, with the Muslim chaplain, the Jewish chaplain, and myself, and we pick a scripture that we, uh, we pick a theme, and each tradition will highlight a particular scripture passage. We'll read that passage from the Quran, from the uh, Hebrew scriptures, and also from the Christian New Testament, and we have this wonderful discussion across those texts. And it, it's deeply enriching to see uh, how this universal truth, be it love, wisdom, peace, or justice, is manifest in these sacred texts. We believe all those, those beautiful books are sacred. They have some deep, deep divine wisdom uh, to be distilled in that discussion. So the students um, uh, find it very challenging. It helps to break down barriers. It also helps to, to instill a sense of commonality amongst the, group, the, stu the students, but I think it also increases the respect and understanding that we need in our world today, mm. so much so. And I would echo that, and not only interfaith discussions, but just studying, studying the Bible with anybody who has a different set of life experiences than you. Um, because we all read scripture through the lens of our own lives and experiences. We all read anything we read through that, that kind of a lens. And so if everybody we study with are only people who are like us in whatever way, um, our, our view of what's before us is totally limited by that, when all of a sudden there are other voices, be they other races, ethnicities, cultures, religions, any of the genders, any of the ways that we're different, when we mix that all up and somebody has a question, you might read the story of Joseph. For example, I used to um, do some work in the prisons uh, before I went into ministry, and I was reading the story of Joseph with a lifer down in Florida. And the one part of the story of Joseph that he could not get past, you know, Joseph is unjustly imprisoned. Um, and when he is finally exonerated and freed, he just goes about his business and the story goes on. That he didn't go back and get vengeance on the person who had sent him there unjustly blew his mind. He couldn't get away. That perspective, I, I'd never, in all the times I'd read the Joseph story, I'd never ever thought of that. But because I was dealing with a prison inmate who was there for murder, you know, serving a life sentence for murder, he had a very different take on what was going on in that story. And it's, th it's that way with all of our life's experiences. So if, if you are in a church and you have only ever done Bible study in that same church and everybody in that church it thinks the same, has basically the same kind of life, you are missing all kinds of perspectives, even if you, even if you just stayed within Christian, even within your denomination. Um, so I, it's, it's all kind of diversity. All right, uh, Tom, please bring us to a close here. If you could get a non-religious person to join your conversation about the Bible, 
I think it would be incredibly valuable. That's a big if. I think that you might ask some and they would say no. Or you might ask some and they say yes and they come there and try to <laughs> tear down faith or maybe be a little bit contentious. But that's not all non-religious people. I mean, hey, look, look, look what's happening now. And Chris has had many conversations of that sort. And so, yes, there are many um, open and good-hearted secular people who would uh, probably be really valuable contributors to that conversation. How? An ability to ask questions that might not occur to believers in the room. Maybe um, being able to see things with a kind of skepticism, hopefully not a mean skepticism, but a friendly skepticism that might not occur to others. I think it'd be really healthy for the dialogue. It may require moving that conversation outside of the confines of churches or outside of a religious setting. But I think it would be really healthy, not just for the religious people there, but for the non-religious people as well. And now you know what to say if they say, and it's all really a myth, you know. <laughs> you say, and yes, and it's true. <laughs> Myths are true. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for their time and their contributions tonight.